Hello everyone, Raquel Buchanan on Facebook Live. Today um, I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've wanted to share and blog about for some time now, but I really haven't had the, I guess, the inspiration or the oomph to do it until today. So I will be uh, talking about what every MFT intern must know. And this is kind of like about the process of transitioning from a trainee to a postgraduate intern. So I guess where I'll start off at is that I would say about six out of 10 interns are experiencing some sort of discontentment with their internship, whether that be because of the demands of the internship, the workload and such, the quality of supervision, or the pay. So a couple weeks ago, I met with a uh, form of mentor, and he had asked me, what is in your five-year plan? So I kind of like took a step back and I thought about this. Well, number one, pay back my student loan debt. Did you hear me on that one? <laughs> um, another one is uh, obtaining those sacred letters of LMFT and also finding a site where my skills are bolstered and I'm receiving appropriate modeling and education from my supervisor. So let's kind of look at the routes that you can take when you get a, uh, when, when you get your degree in marriage and family therapy. Uh, some people can decide that they're not going to do any sort of counseling uh, afterwards and they don't want to get their MFT. So those people can go the route of teaching. Uh, you can also become a, uh, a counselor at a school, a college counselor, or you may even decide that you want to teach at the college level. This route is, uh, is great. However, in some, in some states and even in some colleges or the academic settings, they require that you have some sort of training in teaching and presenting prior to becoming a teacher. So what this means for you is that you're probably going to want to um, start giving presentations, start giving lectures. You want to get out there and show on your resume that I have some experience teaching. Maybe you want to uh, hit up one of your former teachers and ask if you could be a grad assistant for them, if you could grade their papers and such. And one thing that I may say, and I, although I love my degree and I love being a marriage and family uh, therapist and trying to love practicing, the degree in itself is very limited. Um, it's more so of a trade that you decide you're going to do, marriage and family therapy. So even when you decide that, you know, I don't want to be a marriage and family therapist, maybe I want to be a counselor at a school, an academic counselor, you may have to file for equivalency because some of these schools, and I've seen when I've applied to general counseling for colleges, that they're, they're requesting a degree in actual educational counseling or um, some sort of like social work thing. So that's one thing that you want to consider when you do decide to pursue that route. Uh, thank you everybody for your comments so far and thank you all for joining. Okay, so um, the next thing, and I had said before, is that six, I would say that six out of 10 interns have expressed some sort of discontentment with their internship. So I have had the opportunity to experience um, different settings. I did my training ship, uh, my training ship at a nonprofit organization, also a county-based agency. My internship uh, later on is uh, has equated to like kind of a community counseling center as well as a private practice. So I want to go over, I guess, the pros and the cons of each setting and considerations that you want to take when you're pursuing either of these routes. So let's start with uh, the county-based agencies. Uh, your county-based agencies are ones that are funded by the county. They accept Medi-Cal. Um, they're most likely a um, treatment center that the individual can you know, have a, a case manager, have a therapist, and have a psychiatrist. The benefits of a county-based agency in my experience, I received the best training that I could 
ever receive uh, from a county-based agency. I worked at a place called Co uh, College Community Service, and one of the great things about that was they offered free continuing education as a part of uh, it was called Prob Corp. And so at any time, I could access these educational opportunities. And for individuals who need CEUs, this is perfect because you don't have to pay for them. Another thing that I found was that there was weekly supervision, and supervision was guaranteed. They hire supervisors specifically for their interns and their trainees. Though during that experience, I watched a lot of individuals who were working at this agency barely keep afloat. There is a lot of work demand placed on individuals who work in the county-based agencies. And almost always, if you apply for a job at a county-based agency, you are going to be required to also do case management. Case management is very different from therapy. Uh, you're basically not doing any therapy at all. You're doing a lot of intakes, a lot of assessments. You're picking up calls nonstop for clients who need you to help them with housing or help them with any sort of social security issues. Um, and with that, in the county-based agency, you are almost always required to meet a specific uh, hour, you know, hour of direct client hours. And this is uh, very difficult because you also have to keep up with your note taking because that's how they measure your direct service hours. And in that, note taking can be very hard because in order to get funded by these Medi-Cal programs or insurance programs, you have to have the right lingo. So sometimes you'll write notes and they're not going to pass. So that means you don't get your service hours. So in, in short, about uh, the county-based agencies, there is a lot of work required for that. However, on the flip side of the county-based agencies, you're guaranteed hours. You're guaranteed you're getting these hours. And most people who go this track, they will become licensed within a year. They'll get their 3,000 hours within a year. So it's, it's very conducive for individuals who are on the fast track to getting licensed. Um, another part of that, I would say, is that you get full-time benefits. You're getting your, hour, your hourly rate and your full-time benefits. Um, I hate to go back to the downside of the county-based agency, but also the pay, uh, you're going to look at for, you know, your um, entering salary at about, you know, 20 to $25 an hour. So you're working your butt off. You're, you're really working your butt off. Okay, moving on to the nonprofit. Uh, so one thing about nonprofit agencies, have you heard that they give you loan forgiveness after 10 years? I mean, what other uh, benefit can you say other than that? It's like I don't have to pay back my uh, loans after 10 years. Woo! So that's uh, one of the upsides to nonprofit agencies. Uh, similar, similarly, depending on the size of the nonprofit agency, they can run it sort of like a county-based agency. Though in my experience at a nonprofit, I, um, I had a lot of leniency with what I could do, and I think that also has to depend on the, the size of the nonprofit. Um, instead of like talking directly about my experience, I also want to share, I guess, the downside of some organizations. And one of the biggest things that I find um, my colleagues and my friends and other people that I've seen on Facebook groups who are interns about their experience is the quality of their supervision or maybe even the ethicalness at which a organization runs their, their programs. So there are actually a lot of stipulations when you are an intern and things that you can and cannot do and things that your supervisors can and cannot do, which one of the biggest things that I've found out so far is that it is actually illegal for supervisors not to pay you hourly. That, that has been a new progression in our field is that interns have to be paid an hourly wage. And I find that um, some individuals are still breaking this split or paying per session, you're really not supposed to be doing that. Um, there are paid and unpaid opportunities to accrue your hours, but 
if part of our goal is to pay our bills, then of course we are going to want to do uh, paid work, right? You may be able to find a intern opportunity easier if it's not paid, but I think that might contribute to our burnout as clinicians. And also I think that part of it is when we graduate from our programs, we are just so happy that we have our, you know, our, our degree and that we've gotten our number that we may settle for less than we actually deserve. You know, it's like, oh God, I should be happy that I even have a place that wants to take me. We need to know as interns that we have value and that we deserve to be treated in a certain manner, a certain ethical manner as well. Um, another thing that I, I, I might say too is that I have had done splits with my supervisors and I saw, you know, it's a 50-50 split and I saw clients and I wasn't even getting minimum wage. That's also illegal too. Um, I encourage you guys to go on to the CAMP website and check out the different articles they have and about, you know, legal and ethical requirements of being a intern. Um, also, as interns, we need to remember that not only is this person interviewing us, we are interviewing that person because we want to acquire an internship where we are going to be modeled appropriate behaviors, where we are going to be given and fed uh, up-to-date current knowledge. I, I once sat in an interview and this uh, supervisor, potential supervisor, had said to me, Oh, you know, you, don't, you know, to be a supervisor, all you need is only one supervision class. You only need to take one supervision class to be a supervisor, and then poof, you're a supervisor. Um, taking on interns is a very big responsibility, and not only can you damage the intern, but you can get in trouble yourself. So when we are interviewing, remember that we have something to offer, and we need to be asking, is this a good fit for me? Because I find that a lot of my colleagues as well have reported that their supervisor really wasn't a good fit, but they feel stuck because they need their hours. Um, there is a great article on the CAMP website, which I will definitely post for you guys, the questions that you should be asking your supervisors or your potential supervisors to make sure it's a good fit. Um, um, so in summary, uh, six out of 10 interns report some sort of discontentment with their internship site, whether it be because of the f workload that the internship is asking you to do, the quality of supervision, or even the pay. And it's important for us as interns to be knowledgeable consumers as well. And know that just because we're interns, we shouldn't sell ourselves short and we should have this esteem that allows us to pick places and internships that, oh, I didn't talk about private practice. Oh, thank you, Annabelle, thank you so much. Okay, so Annabelle is another uh, colleague um, in the field who works in private practice, and I'm so glad that she reminded that because um, I am in private practice also. Uh, so private practice has been a dream come true for me. Um, I'm my own boss, I get to set my own hours, and I get to charge basically whatever I want. Um, one of the downsides of private practice is that you have to market yourself. And this could be difficult considering that there may be a lot of other clinicians within your area that are taking insurances, which is something that a intern can't directly do, um, or that there are a lot of other people in the area who may specialize in the same thing that you do. So in private practice, there's a lot of additional work that goes on besides just the therapy. And it's also important to have supervisors who will help you and, and build your ideas and build your esteem. Um, Annabelle, I actually, you have been very successful in the private practice, and I'm just going to share that with you, um, my perception. And I want to ask you to maybe share a little bit about your experience or some tips that you would give to individuals who are in the private practice to kind of, 
you know, give them an idea of what they'd be looking for when they go into private practice. Perfect. Uh, so Annabelle's giving us some suggestion about uh, your website has to be more than an online business card. Yes, you have to be interactive. You have to um, really catch and keep relevant on your practice. Um, Annabelle, what are some things that you do to make your website more than just an online business card? Um, so Annabelle talks about uh, how we have to uh, learn about SEO in their websites so that they come up above others in the Google search. Yes, that's very important. And um, I think that if you uh, don't know a lot about I guess the SEO and the whole website thing, that can be kind of a downfall as you have to go and teach yourself that as well. So Booney talks about there's a disconnect with being an unpaid internships, struggling to accrue hours, and wanting to help those who aren't willing to pay the full fee. It's a conflict for starting interns and a huge leap of faith and confidence to believe that you are worth the fee. Yes, this is true. I think that most of us enter this field any, you know, from the get-go because we care about people and we care about the authentic human experience and we want to help people. Um, you know, your clients are smart though. Uh, they're, they're smart. If they can get it for cheaper, they're going to pay for cheaper. But I think that part of that is also setting that boundary with the people you work with saying that, you know, I am worth this much. And, you know, psych studies have proven over and over again that the more someone has invested, the more that they're going to support and back that cause. So if you lower your fees, you may actually be doing a disservice. And this conversation also should be kept in mind with a conversation that I've um, kind of talked about abundance before. We need to have an abundance mentality and know that you may turn someone away because you can't keep um, a lower fee you know, because you need to support yourself, but just know that you will have the clients you need. And let's say that you are charging um, $10 per session, right? You get $10 per session. You will have to work twice, three times, five times more in order to get the, the full amount of money that you need at the end of the month rather than charging, you know, let's say $50 a session and you have to work less. So, you know, who... Let's, let's kind of think of it that way. As interns, we are also kind of struggling with this, I need money, but then I need hours. If I turn away too many clients, then I'm not going to be able to get my hours. And I guess when we think about this, like what is it at the end of the day? Is it more important for me to get my hours or is it more important to me to get the money? And, you know, we, we do, as a profession, we are encouraged to do pro bono work, to really give back to our communities, but we need to make sure that we're in a position that we can do that first. So um, I think that I'm about done speaking on this. I hope that you all have gotten, I guess, the gist of the experience of a uh, intern and what it is an intern needs to know. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, I'll probably refine this and you'll see a written version that'll probably be a lot better. Uh, but thank you for assisting me in this uh, verbal processing. And um, I appreciate everyone's interaction. I will see you guys soon. And uh, please look forward to more videos as well as, uh, I guess, the, I. Another thing I got to give a shout out to Booney is that um, she has uh, volunteered to present at a networking uh, event, that I'm, a networking presentation event on the five things that uh, the gamers in your life want you to know. So I look forward to that event uh, coming up here in uh, August. And thank you guys so much. Thank you, Booney. And uh, see you guys later.